Sheikh Ahmad did that. I greet you and welcome you on behalf of the audience. Now, I think it is the right of the audience that they know you, that they know the private personal facets of Ahmad Didat, the life history of Ahmad Didat in his youth, his beginnings, his life march, and how he reached what he has fulfilled. I was born in India in 1918. My birth heralded peace, the end of the First World War. And as I grew up there, my father was already in South Africa. I hadn't seen my father because he had left the country when I was very small. And as I grew up, the conditions were we were living in a state of famine, starvation. So by the time I was nine, my father called me over to South Africa. And in 1927, at the age of nine, I landed in South Africa. And before my mother could be brought into the country to join the family, she died in India. So me and my father were the only companions, one to the other. I went to school, got my primary education, and because of poverty, I was forced to take on a job as soon as possible. So I started working in a country shop, some 25 miles outside the city of Durban, and across the valley from the shop was a Christian mission. And the missionaries, the training missionaries, were getting training in how to give battle to the Muslims, how to convert the Muslims. They were coming into the shop to do the usual shopping, buying sugar, salt, rice, flour, things like that. But when they came, they also practiced on me and the other staff what they had learned. They would ask questions like this, putting it to me. He says, you know, your prophet Muhammad, he had so many wives. I knew nothing about that. He says, you know your Prophet Muhammad, he copied his Quran from the Jews and the Christians. I knew nothing about that. He said, your Prophet Muhammad, he forced people to accept Islam. That if you don't accept Islam, I'll chop off your head. And he converted the people. I knew nothing about that. The only thing I knew about Islam was that I was a Muslim and I read the Shahada. We call it the Kalima, the Shahada. And if I met you around that time, I would have asked you, where you come from? So you come from UAE. Says, what are you? Suggesting to you, are you a Muslim or what? So you say, no, I'm a Muslim. So I said, read the Shahada. And if you could read the Shahada, if you said, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, you pass. To me, you are a Muslim. If you can't say that, you are not a Muslim. If you can utter that, you are a Muslim. What it meant, I didn't know. It was like a magic formula. If one can say it, he becomes a Muslim. If he can't say it, he's not a Muslim. That's all. That's my knowledge of Islam. I prayed the way my father prayed. I fasted the way he fasted. And I knew that we Muslims don't eat pig, we don't drink alcohol, we don't gamble, we don't dance, and things like that. That was my knowledge of Islam. But these people are making life miserable for me. And there was no way out. Either I leave the job and run away or fight back. But one cannot fight back without knowledge. But Allah is Musa Bibul Asbab. He is the creator of opportunities. He had created in me a hunger for reading. See, maybe because of that loneliness, me and my father, what could we talk? The only two. You go and eat in a hotel and come and sleep in an apartment, sharing the quarters with other people. What can we talk? Nothing. So, somehow, I had developed a hunger for reading. I just must read anything, everything. Go to the library, read all the magazines, read all the books. And at one time, I had, it was hard for me to find a book which I hadn't read. So I had to keep on going through them. And this I wrote, I finished. This already I had read. This I had... It was hard for me to find a book in the library which I hadn't browsed through. 
So this was the hunger that I had, and this hunger of mine led me to find a book called Izharul Haq. And this book changed my life. Sheikh Ahmad did that. At the beginning of your practical life, you were exposed, like many others in South Africa, to the missionary attacks. But unlike others, you took a way and a direction which was special and different. You faced, confronted, and dialogued with your utmost activity and zeal. Is there in your childhood, in your upbringings, what explains that? I think the, the real beginning of this would have been in my genes, what mm. was passed on to me through my father and my mother. My father was a very militant person. Mm -hmm. See, he was, you know, a fighter. My father was a fighter. You know, always in the family, outside the family, and he was a fighter. And maybe I inherited something of that spirit. But I lacked something. And that was physical strength. Because I was starving. I inherited a frame, a big frame, my father and my mother. But because I was starving, I didn't have the strength yes. to, to sh show my militancy, my aggressiveness. So I had to find a way out with my friends. You know, whenever we wrestled, I always found that my friends were stronger than me. And they always beat me. Same size, same everything, same age, but they beat me, and they beat me, and they beat me. So I said, I must find a way out. The way out was, I said, now nah, I must learn judo. And because the strength is not there, so I must acquire the, the art. So I learned judo. Now. I start with them. My friends say, come on, man, let's have a bout. Let's have a wrestling, you know. So they're happy. They know they're always stronger than me. But because of the art I had learned, I was able to beat them. Get them in a grip, he says, give up. Get them in another grip, he says, give up. They can't understand it's how this guy is doing it, you know. But now it was the skill that I used to, now, to, to make up for my physical weakness. Then intellectually, since I had no companionship, no brothers, no sisters, nobody with me, no family, except my father, he goes to work, leaves me alone, I go to school, I come back. The only time we meet is at the table, eating time, in a hotel, and there's no communication between father and son. What can we talk? So reading, reading became my hobby, my pastime, my obsession. I just can't help. If I see anything written, I must read. It's like a sickness. It's like a sickness. So that sickness of mine, I didn't know at that time that Allah wanted me to read that the first word of Wahi, revelation, Allah gives our Nabi Karim sallallahu was Iqra, read. Now I knew nothing about that. But somehow, naturally, I had that tendency to read. And since I read and I read more than all the other, my fellow um, companions at school, at any, I was always superior to them all because I had more vocabulary at my disposal. So naturally now, in, 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 in talking, in arguing, in debating, I was tops among my friends because of my reading. I didn't know all that, but now, that's a, naturally it led me to that. So now it car carried on. If there's a debating society, I would join. I would debate. <laughs> Anything with friends, arguing, debating, arguing, debating. And then until I was thrown into the lion's mouth, so to say, at this Christian mission place. And now the Christian missionary, they are challenging me. And now I get the weapon. Allah Baritala supplied me with an armor, how to defend myself. This book I spoke about, Izharul Haq, was written by Sheikh Rahmatullah Hindi, an Arab, to arm the Indian Muslims against the Christian missionaries. When the British conquered India, they realized that at any time anybody will give them trouble, it will be the Muslims. Because power, rule, dominion was wrenched out of their hands. And a people who has one taste of power, you aspire for it once more. The Hindus of the time, 
the British believed they were like the docile as the cows that they were worshipping. There was no danger from that quarter. The only danger was the Muslim. So they felt that if they can convert the Muslims, if they can teach the Muslims to turn the other cheek, as Jesus has said, resist not evil, he who strikes you on the right cheek, give him the other. Teach the Muslims to turn the other cheek and you can rule India for a thousand years. So with that philosophy, they started pouring in the missionaries into India like frogs in the rainy season. And they started challenging Muslims to public debates. At first, the Muslims were reluctant for two reasons. One was the language. They didn't know English. Second was that these people had just conquered us, and if we spoke too militantly, we might be sent to the Andaman Islands, like Robben Island in South Africa, Andaman Islands in the Bay of Bengal. We call it Kalapani, black waters. Send them away, ship them there. So they, nobody wanted to go to the, the, the Andaman Islands. So it says, peace, silence is golden. Now the Christian missionaries, they mastered our language, and they started challenging the Muslims to debate in our own language, it's in Urdu. We want to challenge you in your own language. And the debates that took place, this book re records. So now I'm reading that book, and I can see now, I said, look, man, these are the answers to the Christian missionary attack. So what I learned from this book, I started practicing on the Christians. That's my, become my hobby, my pastime. It's my hobby. Every Sunday morning, before when they come to do the shopping before Sunday, I said, hey, where are you going on Sunday after church? Said, yeah. To the Christian missionaries. He said, where are you going on Sunday after church? He says, nowhere. I said, where do you live? So it's a country place. He said, give me direction. This way. I said, right, I see you 11 o'clock Sunday morning. I said, right. So we go along and have a discussion, a dialogue. And actually, my psychology was, at that time, for every one point you give me in your favor, I give you 10 against it. That's the only thing that I knew, and I did that well. And out of that, developed all the techniques that have followed. Yes. It seems obvious, Sheikh Ahmed, am I right in this, that you were affected very much by the book Idhar al-Haq. May be that this book has influenced the ways and methods you use in Dawah. Let us speak about your methods in Dawah. What are your methods, your ways in Dawah and confrontation? What are the axes that you are keen to abide with in confronting the attacks against Muslims? by the missionaries. I think the natural thing was, the natural tendency was, which is natural to, should be to every human being, is to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. It's quite natural. And I acted naturally that if anybody made any claim, that like in judo, you see, I was trying to use the strength of my enemy. Mm -hmm. I used his strength against him. That's judo, the gentle art of self-defense. Mm -hmm. I haven't got sufficient strength, so I use the strength of the opponent against him. So same thing in intellectual battle. Same thing happens now. Whatever his force, I must now use his force against him. At that time, and for a long period of time, I didn't know that Allah Ta'ala wanted me to do that also. Like Iqra, he wanted me to read, I was reading, without knowing the ayah. It's natural, it's natural. Same thing Allah tells us, that if anybody makes any claim, mm -hmm. you ask him for his burhan. Allah says, Qul haatu burhanakum. Produce your burhan. In kuntum sadiqeen. If you're speaking the truth, let me have a look at your certificate. And that was, to me, also natural. Isla to me, Islam is a natural religion. If you behave naturally, you'll be following Allah's instruction. Only naturally. And I think I was just relaxed, you know, like the magnetic needle of the compass, whichever way the magnetic attraction came, I, I went. And to me now, the natural behavior was, whatever the man claims, he tells me that sin is inherited. I didn't, I couldn't quote him the Quran. I didn't know the Quran at the time. That no bearer of a burden bears the burden of another. I didn't know all that. The only thing I can ask him is, where? What does it say? They say, Jesus is God. I said, what does it say, your book? Let me see. What is the claim? He said, Christ died for your sins. I said, show me. What does it say? And I found all the answers there. 
as if I knew the ayah how to burhan akun. In other words, Allah is telling us that the guy hasn't got the burhan. He hasn't got proof. Ask him for this proof. In other words, telling me he hasn't got proof. So I just behave naturally, and out of that natural behavior, everything now is a natural reaction. Whatever the man claims, I just ask him where. Like the latest is this Christmas thing. You know, I happen to just come into the country on the eve of Christmas. I landed on the 25th, the night of the 25th in Abu Dhabi. And everywhere, this I had been here a little time before. Actually, I was here in UAE three times. I have come now three times in three weeks. The normal coming to this part of the world was once in three years. But this latest sequence of my visits is I visited the UAE three times in three weeks. I have come into the country, gone out of the country. Came in again into the country, gone out again into the country. Come in again into the country, and now uh, tomorrow night I'm returning home. Three times in three weeks. And it was just coincidental on the eve of Christmas I'm here. And I see Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, lightings and everything in the shops and in the hotel. You know, the music is going on, you know. They keep me awake till one o'clock in the morning, you know. Men and women dancing and singing and all. So, man, what's going on? So now, I said, now what are you people doing? Just celebrating Christmas. So I'd like to know. I said, now, what is that? I know, I know what, what is Christmas, meaning the birth of Christ. The day of the birth of Christ. But I'm asking, what is this Christmas? And no, the birth of Jesus Christ. So I said, when was he born? They would naturally say 25th of December because more than 1 billion Christians of the world, they all celebrate the 25th of December as the birth of Jesus Christ. So 25th of December. Now, because I know, I know his book, his Burhan, I know. Allah said, ask him for his Burhan. I know the Burhan. So from that knowledge of mine, I'm asking, does your Burhan, not that the news of Burhan, your Bible, does it say that Christ was born on the 25th of December? They're puzzled. Actually, they're puzzled because they don't know whether it's written there. They're celebrating it. I said, no, there's no such thing in the Bible. That Christ, there's no such word as Christmas Day, and there's no such thing as the 25th of December. Where did you get it? I said, you see, Jesus Christ was not born on the 25th of December. I said, when is your birthday? When was, what is your birthday? So the person tells me, he said, no, it's the 30th of June. So I says, now let's say we commemorate your birthday on the 1st of January. You know, it's easier to remember for everybody, 1st of January. Would you be happy? He says, no. I said, if everybody agrees, he says, no, he's not happy. He is yeah. 30th of June. He wants his birthday to be commemorated. So I said, now Jesus Christ, was he born on the 25th of December? I said, the Quran and the Bible says to the contrary. I said, what? I said, your Bible as well as the Quran are telling me something to the contrary of this. An opportunity, nice an opportunity for me to deliver my message. Any excuse to me, I said, fine, any excuse, deliver the message. Now I find this is the Allah says, Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati. Say, invite all to the ways of the Lord with wisdom. Wal mawazat al hasanat and with beautiful preaching. Wa jadilhum billati ahsan and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Mm -hmm. So, this is what I find. So I'm asking them. That's the Quran and the Bible. They both agreed that Jesus Christ was not born on the 25th of December. So what is what is the evidence? So the evidence says, I said, you see, when Jesus was born, according to the Gospel of Saint Luke, mm -hmm. chapter two, verse eight, mm -hmm. it tells us that at night the angels came and they found shepherds out in the field. And the shepherds were told that the child is born to a woman in Bethlehem. Good news about the birth of Jesus Christ. The shepherds were out in the field. And 25th of December is midwinter in Palestine. No Jew will be so foolhardy, should be so foolish, to be out in the open air in the field with his flock. He will freeze to death and his flock will freeze to death. So it must have been a warm evening for people to be out in the field, not midwinter, yeah. the coldest day of the year, not that.
Then the Holy Quran also suggests the same. In Surah Maryam, ayah number 25, it tells us that when the child was being born, a voice was heard, an angel of the Lord, telling her, he says, look, the date palm, you are under the date palm, he says, shake the palm leaf and it will let fall fresh ripe date. So, fresh ripe date, I think the Arabs, you don't have to prove to the Arabs, you know, that you need midsummer to produce ripe dates. For to be so ripe as if you shake it and it let fall the dates. So, it was midsummer, says the Quran, and the Bible suggests also midsummer. But you are celebrating midwinter. Where did you get this? <laughs> So, in other words, now, this is, to me, is a most uh, natural way, beautiful way of proving your point from his own book and from yours. I so I'm supporting you, but now you people have just gone off the track and you're celebrating the 25th of December, which is not the birth of Jesus Christ. Sheikh Ahmad did that. From your factual experience in propagation in English language and from your friction with non-Muslims, what are the methods and means of non-Muslims in propagating their faith among Muslims? At the beginning, the method was to attack. To say Muhammad was a false prophet. He had so many wives. He spread his religion at the point of the sword. Thinking by it and the Quran was a fabrication. All this type of things, thinking that by that they'll be able to get converts. But they could not gather much honey with that. So then the Orientalists came along with their new technology and their method was to say, to praise the Prophet that he was a sincere man. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, won't say, they won't say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but say Muhammad was a sincere man, but a false prophet. Now it's a harder to deal with. He was a, sincere, he was a uh, sincere man, but a false prophet. That's the Orientalist. Mm -hmm. They would say that we find no deliberate deception on his part. Mm. Meaning that Muhammad Sallallahu he didn't deliberately deceive the people, but poor man was ignorant. He inadvertently he deceived the people. We sympathize with him. Now that was the Orientalist. But now the missionaries, they are const constantly in the field. And they learn new, new techniques. Mm. One of them is they would visit the Muslim in these countries where we are in a minority, it's happening. They visit the Muslim home. And the Muslim, you know, although we don't know the expression Ahlan wa Sahlan, in our mentality, we are the same, like the Arabs. Most Islam has done it to us. Anybody comes, welcome. Without even saying it, tea and coffee getting ready. Mm. It's an unwritten law among us, Muslims of, of, of India or Pakistani extraction. It's an unwritten law. Mm. Welcome. Even if the man has come to kill the husband, the wife is going to get tea ready for him. This is our behavior, like the Arabs, Ireland was Ireland, say. So we settle these questions, welcome them, sit down, and they start. This is Brother Munim, Brother Salam. Do you believe in Jesus? Sure. He says, he knows the answers. He knows the answers. Actually, he's setting you up. See, there's a new method now. You believe in Jesus? The man says, yes, I believe in Jesus. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus. Right. He says, you know, my Jesus is one of the mightiest messengers of God. Do you accept that? The Muslim says, yes, no, no, we accept that. He knows the answers, but he's setting you up. He says, you know, my Jesus, he says, now he says, my Jesus was born miraculously yeah. without any male intervention. Do you believe that? The Muslim says, yes, we believe. Now, was your Muhammad born like that? The Muslim says, no. He had a father and a mother. He said, yes, like you and me. The Muslim says, yes. He's proved a point. Without telling you that Jesus is one degree above Muhammad. Mm. He's not telling you that, but he proved it to you. Mm. He says, you know, my Jesus is Messiah. Messiah. Translated Christ. It's Masihullah, Allah's Messiah. Do you accept that? The Muslim has got to agree. He says, no, no, we believe. He's Masihullah, Allah's Messiah. Was your Muhammad Masihullah? 
the Muslim says, no, he was Rasulullah. But you see, my Jesus is Masih and Rasul in the Quran. It's a Masih who is Ibn Maryam. Rasul and Ila Bani Israel. He's Rasul and Masih. Your prophet is only a Rasul in your Quran. The Muslim says, yes, that is so. He's proved again that Jesus is one degree above Muhammad, another degree above Muhammad. He says, you know, my Jesus gave life back to the dead. He says, yes, yes, Bismillah. He says, okay, Bismillah. Did your Prophet Muhammad give life back to the dead, Bismillah? The Muslim says, I don't know. Maybe some hadith is somewhere, I don't know. See? So he says, Jesus is another degree above Muhammad. He says, now, where is your Prophet Muhammad? You say, he's buried in Medina. Perhaps his bones have rotted in the grave. The Muslim says, no, we believe he's Hayatun Nabi. He's the living Prophet. He said, that is metaphysically, man. But physically, maybe his bones have rotted in the grave. So he says, maybe. Where is my Jesus? He said, he's in heaven. He's alive. You said, he's alive. He's coming back. He said, he's coming back. Proving again that Jesus is another degree above Muhammad. He said, now, don't you think God had a purpose in doing all that? He does things for nothing. Only in a month or two, you're going to celebrate Eid al Duha, festival of sacrifice. You're going to sacrifice a sheep or a goat or a cow or a camel without blemish. Hmm? Cow, horn not broken, ear not cut, not blind, not limping, right? Mm -hmm. Muslims say, no, right. You look for a perfect animal for your kurbani. I said, yes. Don't you think God Almighty, when he wants to make kurbani for his creation, is he going to look for second best? And he's already proved to you who is second best. Yeah, Muhammad, the second best. Now, argue, argue with him. The ordinary man, very difficult. Even the learned man, this is not his field. You see, he hasn't been involved in this type of battle. The answers are so easy, Allah, so easy. You get one of my little booklets called Christ in Islam that answers all that. How to turn the table against the Christian. Whatever he says, Qul hatu burhanakum. Turn the tables. Qul hatu burhanakum. Turn the tables. This is hikmah. But now we have lost the art because for a thousand years we didn't do the job. So we lost the art of doing the job. Now, by accident, well, it's Allah's. He's created the opportunities for me. But to me now, it, everything is happening by accident. It just happens. I'm pushed along this way and that way and that way, and I'm meeting the obstacles, the challenges, and it's taking me to a higher and higher level. Nothing is planned. Wallah, nothing is planned. The debate with Shagat was not planned. With Shorosh was not planned. All my works are not planned. It's just happening. Force of circumstances forces me to do this, forces me to do that, to write this book, to write that book. <laughs> All this is coming about by force of circumstances. Sheikh Ahmed, and... Uh... You have aroused me, and I believe that you have aroused the viewers as well, when you mentioned the comparison between Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Jesus alayhi salam, quoting the Christian missionaries. We want you now, we want you to give us the answer. What do we say? How do we answer? You see, as I said, the answers are available in this booklet of mine, small booklet. But now to give you an example, one example. The person said that Jesus is Masih and Rasul in the Quran, but your prophet is only Rasul. Mm. So we are caught now. We are caught. That is so. So now this word Masih, we are asking, what does it mean? Masih, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. In the Hebrew language, Masih comes from the root word Masaha. In Arabic, Masih comes from the root word Masaha. Mm -hmm. Masaha means to rub, to massage, to anoint. We Muslims, when we go for Salat, we make wudu, and in that we wet our hands after washing our faces, and we rub ourselves over the head and the back of the neck, and we do this, and we call it Masah. I don't know whether the Arabs call it the same, but we Hindi Muslims, we call it Masah. Right, we say, we say Masah, we do Masah. Same word as coming from the word root word to make it Masi and Messiah, same, that you rub over. Priests and kings were anointed 
to be rubbed over with holy oil or with holy water to that position. And every prophet of God is anointed, means appointed. Anointed means appointed. That's what it means. And this word Messiah in the Bible is used not only for Jesus, now how to burhan akun, his burhan. This word for, used for Cyrus, a pagan, a mushrik. In the book of Isaiah in the Bible, it says that you are my Messiah. But they don't put Messiah, they put anointed. I said, what is the original word in Hebrew for that word anointed? It's Messiah. Mm -hmm. God Almighty is calling a mushrik, a kafir, his Messiah. So if a mushrik and a kafir can be a Messiah in your book, this is not a title as such that you can put him, elevate him to the skies. Then this priest and kings were anointed. The word in the Bible is again anointed. In Hebrew, Messiah. Mm -hmm. They were all anointed. It means specially appointed for a certain purpose. Horns, horns, they used to wear horns and things in the... Were anointed, means in the Hebrew, Messiah. The horns were made messy. Pots and pans were anointed. Means made messy. How you make pots and pans into messy? No, no. It means that, look, to your family, you buy this special tea, tea set, and you say, now, look, this is for very important people. People like Mr. Dida, you say, when the visitors will take this out. For our own home, we'll use our old your, your cups and saucers. Okay? So now in Hebrew, that, that setting aside is called anointed. In Hebrew, Messiah. Masih. So I said, every prophet is anointed, every prophet is Masih, but we have a system that certain titles exclusively are used for certain people. For example, we are speaking about Khalilullah. Ask any Muslim, who's Khalilullah? I said, Ibrahim. Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam. He is the friend of Allah. Was Musa not his Khalil? No. Not Allah's friend? Was, he not, was he Allah's enemy? Musa alayhi salam, Dawud alayhi salam, Suleiman alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, Hazrat Muhammad Musa, were they all his enemies? No, they were all Khalil. But this title we exclusively use for Ibrahim alayhi salam. Though they are all his Khalil. Then we speak about Kalimullah. Who's Kalimullah? You say Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam is Kalimullah. Allah spoke to him. Didn't Isa speak to Allah? Didn't Muhammad alayhi salam speak to Allah? They were all doing Kalimullah. But no, this title exclusively we use for Musa alayhi salam. Though it's applicable to all the other prophets to whom Allah spoke. So this is like also in human language. They, in English history, they were teaching us about Alfred the Great. Alfred the Great, the guy who burned the cake in, uh, in English history. What makes him great? Burning the cake? No, it's a title given to him. Richard the Lionhearted. In English history, they taught us. He was a lion-hearted. I said, all the other English kings were chicken-hearted. We were all chicken-hearted. This guy's only lion-hearted. Everybody else is chicken-hearted. I said, no, no. This is a title you exclusively use. But there can be many lion-hearted other rulers and kings. So this is the way, I said, the titles were exclusively used. Isa is Masihullah. That doesn't mean the others were not anointed, not appointed. But that's what it actually means in Hebrew. So this is the way, I said, an easy way of answering. Jesus was born without a father. Mm -hmm. so, yes. So the Quran gives us the answer. Inna mathala Isa, inna Allahi kamasali Adama, khalakahu min turabin, thumma qala lahu kun fayakun. They say, yes, yes, but you see he was created from dust. Mm -hmm. Jesus was born, you know. He was begotten. Jesus is the only begotten son. Begotten, not made. No, the Quran reacts to that. But he's talking. I said, look, man. So Jesus is greater than Muhammad because he had no father. He said, yes. But Adam had no father and no mother. He should be greater than Jesus. I said, no, no, no. Not. I said, then look, there's another person in your Bible, in the book of Hebrews, in your Kitab al -Mukaddas, in the book of Hebrews, Chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Melchizedek, Melchizedek, Malik Sadek Saleh, in Hebrew. Melchizedek, the high priest of Salem. Salem means Jerusalem. Mm. It says, I'm reading from his Kitab al Muqaddas, without father, without mother, without beginning, without end. I said, that's only God. 
This is God's qualities, man. Without beginning, without end, no father, no mother. This man is like God. I want to know why don't you worship him? Jesus had a mother, didn't he? His mother carried him for nine months. The Bible confirms it. That when he was eight days old, he was circumcised and named Jesus by the angel when he was in his mother's womb. He was in his mother's womb. He had a mother. This man had no mother. If Jesus had no father, this man had no father and no mother. He's greater than Jesus. Jesus had a beginning in the stable, according to you. And he had an apparent end, apparent end on the cross. We know we believe. But apparent end, according to you, he had on the cross. He had a beginning in the stable and he had an apparent end on the cross. This man had no end. Who is greater? Jesus or Melchizedek? From every standard given by you, any common sense, it's a Melchizedek, it's greater. But you never hear his name. Christian then doesn't know this man. It's in his book. So I said, there is no better way to talk to a people than with their own background and their own experience. That is hikmah, and which we have failed to use. But when you use it, it is so pleasant, man, so nice. And it gives you, you know, such strength and power that you are able to de deliver your message without creating real offense, or real antagonism. Sheikh Ahmed, Sheikh Ahmed did that. Talking to you is enjoyable and amusing to a great extent. Therefore, we shall continue and prolong our conversation. The missionary attacks against Islam, according to your knowledge, to your experience and information, did it achieve in success? Also, their campaigns among non-Muslims, did it achieve any success also? Yes. You see, the Christians are boasting, and I do not think that it's an empty boast, that at the beginning of the 19th century, Africa, the continent of Africa, was 3% Christian. Today, they have reached 40%. 40% of Africa is Christian, and by the turn of this century, by the year 2000, they want to make Africa a Christian continent, and there are every signs that they will succeed. In Pakistan, they are boasting that they have converted more Pakistanis into Christianity since independence than in the previous hundred years of British rule. In Bangladesh, they have converted more Bangladeshis into Christianity since independence than the previous hundred years of British rule. In Indonesia, they are boasting they have converted 15 million Indonesians into Christianity. And by the turn of this century, they want to make Indonesia a Christian nation. And there are every sign that they will succeed. There are so many cities in Pakistan, which the Pakistan is not aware, that the Christians are boasting they have more than one lakh Christians each. This word lakh, to us on the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent, sounds like a million. When you say lakh, it sounds like a million, actually 100,000, 100,000. That's more than 100,000 Christians. Each Karachi, more than one lakh Christians. Multan, one, more than one lakh Christians. Lahore, more than one lakh Christians. Sialkot, with the border with the enemy, more than two lakh Christians. And there are so many towns and villages in the Punjab, there are more Christians than Muslims. This is what they're claiming and they're boasting about. And I think their boast is not false. They deserve this success because they are working. It's hard to imagine. It's very, it's impossible for the Muslim to imagine the magnitude of the work that is being carried out. If I may give you an example, you know, of just one small group, one small group of Christians. They call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. They originated in America about a hundred years ago. That little group of Christians, they don't number two million in the world today, not even two million. They have a magazine called the Watchtower announcing Jehovah's Kingdom, Watchtower. Mm -hmm. And they're giving me figures here that the average printing, each issue is 13 million and 45,000. Okay. Magazine, not, not leaflet like that. 13 million and 45,000 magazines a month in 104 languages, including your Arabic. Can you imagine such a thing? 13 million a month. The same little group of people, they have another magazine called Awake. Wake up. 
اسم اس اللہ تعالیٰ سے تو ویک اپ یا ایوہ المدثر کم فانزر دے سے ویک اپ اویک لوگ اوپن انسائیڈ اس لئے تل اس that they publish this magazine 13 million 240 thousand in 67 languages including your Arabic and not forgetting our Zulu <laughs> can you imagine such a thing the whole Muslim world put together we can't produce a million like this 13 million of there's only one group 13 million of this and the same little group of people they have a book called the truth that leads to eternal life. They produced this book, 84 million copies in 95 languages. Are, are you listening? 84 million in 95 languages. And this book is not a booklet. It's not a little booklet. This book is 192 pages. In your language, you are not forgotten. They have it also in Arabic. One little group of people and there are a thousand million Christians in the world with a thousand different sects and denominations and each and everyone is working. The Seventh-day Adventists, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Lutherans, the Presbyterians, and the Mormons, and the Mennonites. Shh, you name them, there are a thousand different groups and denominations and they are all looking for converts. They're working, they're working. They're not worried about their own countries at home. They can be rotten to the core, but they're interested in you. They want to save you from hellfire. They're sincere. To me, the people are sincere. According to the belief, they're doing the job, the master's job. The thing is that we Muslims, we have failed to do our job. They have produced the Bible in 2,000 different languages. 2,000 different languages. Hmm? So far, 2,000. And for the Arabs, they have produced 11 different Arabic Bibles. The understanding I had was that there was only one Arabic Quran. And to me, this is the language of the Arabs. All Arabs. To me, are speaking the language of the Quran. Mm -hmm. Christians know better than that. They have produced for the Arabs Arabic characters. This is for the educated Egyptians and the Saudis and the Kuwaitis, people like that. Then they have the Bible, the Arabic script, but this is the Tunisian script. How the Tunisians, they're writing, how they go. Tunisian script. And they have the Arabic in the Syrian, Karshuni script. I didn't know all this. Then they have the Algerian colloquial script. Different lahja, different uh, script. Algerian Tunisian colloquial for Algeria and Tunisia. Egyptian colloquial, street language of Egypt. They have this for the classical al Azhar graduates. And they have the, another one for the street language. You know, the Falahins. For the Falahins, they got a different one. Make it easy for them. <laughs> and all, all Moorish colloquial. Uh, Palestinian. I didn't know they're different. They're different dialect, different dialect. I didn't know. I said, it's all one. This is not one, man. They said, it's not one. Arabic, Southern Sudan, colloquial, different. <laughs> and Tunisian colloquial, street language of, of Tunisia. So 11 different Arabic Bibles for you, which the Muslim world know nothing about what is going on. So they are relaxed. Alhamdulillah, everything is all right. Everything is not all right. They're making efforts to get through to you, to the Arabs. The Arab world is under attack. You don't know. You're satisfied. Everybody's satisfied. <laughs> They're planning a master planning. They want to have churches in every Muslim land, including Makkah and Medina. Establishing churches throughout the Muslim countries, most especially the Arab countries. They are not interested in the Arab countries. Because to get an Arab, to get a Saudi, or to get a, a UAE national to accept Islam, is like getting a diamond. I am to accept Christianity, is to, to get a diamond. And to get a thousand Nigerians or a ton, thousand Chinese or a thousand Indians is like a ton of coal. You know, it's, cheap, it's cheaper than a diamond. To get you, they are now interested in you. You are a challenge. The Muslim is a challenge. And they are working and working very hard. The Muslim is unaware. He is sitting back relaxed. It's about time that he woke up. Christian missionary, you see, since he's in the field of propagation, missionary activity, he has found ways and means of getting to the heart and the mind of the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. And he uses techniques which the Muslim will accept. Here is a book which says, Share Your Faith with a Muslim. Share your faith, Christianity, with the Muslim. How? 
how to get to him, what to talk to him, what not to talk about. This is the secret they are giving to the Christian missionaries, how to talk to the Muslim. And in that, these are some of the strategies they use. They have produced this beautiful, I call it Tughra, I don't know what you call this, you know, beautiful writings, Arabic, Quranic calligraphy, because when I first saw it, to me it looks like the Quran, yeah. everything looks like the Quran, like everything looks like the Quran, and I showed this to an Arabic scholar, a lecturer. I can't name him, but when I showed him these, he's looking at this and he says, uh, this is, I mean, to him it's the Quran, he's accepted this as the Quran, but he can't understand this word in the Quran. He can't remember anywhere in the Quran where the Quran says, Abbana. So he's gap, grappling with that word, Abbana, Abbana. You know, is there such a thing in the Quran? Because it's not half of the Quran. But he's wondering, he said, I don't think so. Then I'm telling him that this is not Quran, this is the Holy Bible. This is the Christian Kitab al Muqaddas. This is the Christian Kitab al Muqaddas. This is the Christian Kitab al Muqaddas. These are being given to Muslims free of charge. And the Muslim, poor Muslim, the non Arab, especially the non Arab, you know, the Bangladeshi, the Pakistani, the Indonesian, the Malaysian, the Nigerian, the Ghanaian, the Falahins of Egypt. I take it, they will accept this, kiss it, and put it on the wall in their homes. And in some of these mud masjids we have, you know, they'll put it in the masjid as well. You know, says, so look, this is the Quranic ayah, man. In South Only, Africa? No, no, not in South Africa. They had, but in the rest of the world, there are unsophisticated, in Malawi, in Tanzania, in India. But there are millions of Muslims who will accept this as the Quran and kiss it and hang it on the wall. This is one of the techniques. They know how to catch fish. They know what the fish likes, the Muslim samak. You see? Mm -hmm. The uh, American, American, he says, I like strawberry and cream as a desert. He likes strawberry and cream. But he said, when I go fishing, I put a worm. Mm -hmm. You know why? He says, because the fish likes worm. So this fish, the Muslim fish, will like this. He doesn't like it. He hates it. But now this is the way to catch the Muslim fish. Look at this. Mm -hmm. They're offering you a two-year calendar, free. Beautiful. I showed this to an Arab sheikh. I showed this to an Arab sheikh. He said, Allah Muhammad. I said, Ya Akhi, have another good look. He said, Allah Muhammad. I said, have a good look. Allah ya Muhabba. Then he said, Allah Muhabba. An Arab sheikh can get caught with this. What about a poor Bangladeshi, or a Hindi, or a Ghanaian, or a Nigerian? Looks like Allah, Muhammad, Allah, Muhammad. They're catching Muslim fish. They give this to our children. Stickers, stickers to stick in your book. Abbana. And the Muslim at first glance, he thinks maybe it's Rabbana, Atina, Fid Dunya, Hassanatam. No, this is the human mind. You see, we're not actually reading. Something suggests something to us, and we think we are reading what is there, but you're reading what's in your mind. Catching Muslim fish. Muslim fish. Al Kitab. Al Kitab. It suggests to us, Zalik al Kitab, Ula Raybafi, Hudalil Muttakin. That's what you're thinking. But no, this is talking about the Holy Bible. They're offering you a free Bible course. Hmm? Here is here, a Muslim here, looks like a Sudanese or a Ghanaian. Muslim sitting on the ground and is reading the Subhi, Tasbi, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. And it's written on the top here, in, in, al, in Allah yubashiruki bi kalimatim minhu ismuhul masih or Isa ibn Maryama, written in Arabic. Given to the Muslims, free, outside the masjids given to you free. So every Muslim receives it, he sees the Quranic ayah, he kisses it, takes it home and puts it with his Quran. This is Christian propaganda. Hmm. Here is a book here, Why I Became a Christian, by Sultan Muhammad Paul. He was Sultan Muhammad, now he's become Paul. Hmm? You react, but when you open the book, inside you find ayahs from the Quran. Ayahs from the Quran. To catch fish. The Muslim fish. When you see ayahs from the Quran, automatically you, we kiss it. We are trained. 
This is the habit we have cultivated when you see Allah's kalam. <laughs> Allah's kalam. What you do with this now? This is a Christian propaganda. You tear it, you say, no, no, Allah's kalam there. You burn it, you say, no, Allah's kalam there. So put it next to the Quran. A snake in the house. You, now you're going to harbor, you're going to protect the snake <laughs> from destruction. This is the masters, the master psychologist. Here is one another here. Kaifa nusalli, feel the production. Sulk. It's like sulk. Kaifa <laughs> nusalli, making a mockery of our salat. Huh? You, if you don't agree, but you can't help reading it. Man, it's so beautifully produced, so beautiful production. I says, no, they are working, they are working, they are working. All these here, all these here. You know, I says, if I were to start one by one, here is a guy here, the source of, uh, the, 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 of assurance, the way to assurance. This guy is a Hindi. His name is K.K. Alawi. And to every Muslim, he's a Muslim. And he looks more Muslim-like than my interviewer. You know, clean-shaven and all that. This guy here, you know, the right standard size beard he's got. You know, Zulfa, you know, the long hair of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to have Zulfa, what we call you see. Look. Huh? And now, in silk, in Arabic, if you don't know English, if you don't know uh, English, he got it for you in Arabic. Wouldn't you like to read it? And free, bakshish. All these are given to you, bakshish, bakshish, hadiyah, 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 to catch you the Muslim fish. Now, what is the answer to this? You see, if I was to speak about myself, what I'm doing and all that, you say, I'm blowing my own trumpet. I want people to know me. Wallah, I don't need it. I don't need it. I'm 76 years old. I'm not looking for a new wife. And Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed me. I get my salary and I live well on that. I need nothing. What I want to sell? I'm not selling any of my books. Millions of books are given away free. There's no copyright on my books. There's no copyright on my videotapes. As a producer and salesman, you do business, make money. What do I want? I want to promote myself. What do I want to do? What do I want to achieve? But now, the testimony, the real testimony, comes from the enemy. When the enemy tells you must look, watch out for Lidad, then you must listen to him. Don't listen to me. Here is a book produced in South Africa. The Challenge of Islam in South Africa. Written by a Christian missionary. The Challenge of Islam in South Africa. Muslim is a challenge. Because they have tried and tried and they can't seem to make a headway. They are losing, but not to the extent that they wish. Not to the extent that they are getting Hindu converts or enemies converts, they can't get so many Muslims. So Muslim is a challenge. You read this book, this Christian missionary, he uses the name Ahmad Didat more times than his Lord Jesus Christ in this book. It's Ahmad Didat. Ahmad Didat. He is the arch enemy. He is the obstacle. Then somebody more charitable, the Baptist Church of America. They have the over 4,000 of the missionaries working throughout the world. The Crusaders, the Mujahids. They have a magazine called The Commission. They send the uh, journalist to South Africa to find out what the Muslims are doing in South Africa. And they visited my office in my absence. Even if I was there, I wouldn't have objected. They came along to investigate what we are doing, how we are doing, what we are doing. And they wrote an article. They wrote an article. And the title of the article is South Africa a defender of Islam. This is what they call me. The Muslim says, I'm a brawl, I'm looking for trouble. The Christian recognizes me that I am a defender of Islam. And the works that I'm doing, they say, is that for anybody who want to do any missionary work in Africa, you aspire to do any missionary work in Africa, you have to familiarize yourself with the works of Ahmad Didat. Before you go on to do missionary work, you must familiarize with this as here. If for anyone who would witness to English-speaking Muslims, especially in Africa, the broad sides of Islamic defender, Ahmad Didat may be required reading. This is the testimony that the enemy pays to the work that I am doing. They feel that you have to master Ahmad Didat's works. Now what does Ahmad Didat do? He's answering all this in books like this. But now, before that, let me give you just one more. You see, Allah Bari Ta'ala in the Holy Quran, He challenges mankind. He says, قُلْ لَئِنِ جِتَامَ أَتِلْ إِنْسُ وَالْجِنُّ 
Allah yatu bi misli hazal Quran that if the whole of mankind and the jinns if they were to gather together to produce the life of this Quran is Allah yatu na bi mislihi walau kana ba'dhum li ba'din zahira they'll never be able to produce a like thereof even if they backed up each other with help and support that's the challenge stood for 1400 years but our cousins the arab christians they are not a people to give up they says no 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 we can produce something it's in arabic muhammad is an ummi if he can do it we learn it people among the arabs we know arabic better than these muslim arabs why can't we produce one so they produced it they say to answer the challenge of the quran here it says this is the new book siratul masih bil lisan arabi fasih that's their boast this is fasih this was printed in cyprus and they are using this look the form the format is quranic yeah the writings of course the arabic that is present to us and i would like you for a change i would like you to read it to our viewers i would like you to read it because of course it's your language i want you to start you know from the top and read it as if you were reading the quran just pretend that this is the quran and you're reading it with the same style of the quran babu sakina 27 babu sakina maqdisi why maqdisi because it was uh, revealed in uh, bait al maqdis perhaps like mecca and madina right. maybe right so maybe. Su- this i am uh, just trying to okay, answer okay. no no right they are suggesting that you see the muslim knows surahs makkiyah madaniya yes. makkiyah madaniya but everybody is not literate every muslim 90% of the muslims of the world are non arabs and they said they have heard makkiyah madaniya maybe when our nabi akram sallallahu was taken from miraj at baitul muqaddas he led all the prophets in the salat and maybe some wahi came down there which we might overlook out of the 114 surahs maybe one of the surahs was revealed there in baitul muqaddas so now sounds all right maqdisi read now start uh bismillahir rahmanir rahim any objection does it sound like the quran does it sound like the quran it's quranic so he's suggesting that he can produce something like the quran and to the illiterate muslims he said listen man bismillahir rahmanir rahim so sounds quran so yes start okay qul ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu aha he said listen 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 qul ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sounds quran Sounds like the Quran? Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> in kuntum tu'minuna billahi haqqan fa'aminu bihi. In kuntum tu'minuna billahi. Sounds Quran? Mm-hmm. Now, you see, this is being recited from Monte Carlo Radio. Like Abdul Samad Abdul Basit. They have artists who can reproduce the style of Abdul Samad Abdul Basit. And you listen, it says, sounds like Abdul Samad Abdul Basit. But I thought the man has passed away. He has died. But I said, maybe this is a tape recording. So, right, you are listening. Mm-hmm. Read on. Is it enough? No, no, just a few more words. In kuntum tu'minuna billahi haqqan fa'aminu bi wa la takhafu inna lakum inda Allahi jannatin nuzula. Carry on. Carry on. Yakfi. Carry on, yes. Fala asbiqannakum ila Allahi li'u'iddaha lakum thumma la'atiyannakum نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى وَإِنَّكُمْ لَتَعْرِفُونَ السَّبِيلَ إِلَيْ السَّبِيلَ إِلَى قِبْلَتِي الْعُلْيَا فَقَالَ لَهُ تُومَا الْحَوَارِي مَوْلَانَا إِنَّا لَا نَمْلِكُ مِنْ ذَلِكَ عِلْمًا Right, it's enough. Now, to you, a sophisticated Arab, you can see that this is all funny. They have stolen from the Quran phrases, sentences, to make it look like the Quran. But to the illiterate millions, then 90% of the Muslims of the world, when it is read like the Quran, it sounds like the Quran. Mm-hmm. So, catching fish, so look, we have answered it. You say we can't produce, here we have produced, accept it now, that this is God's word. So, what is the answer to all this? I have written a book called The Choice. The Choice between Islam and Christianity. And this, what you have just read now, is reproduced in here. 
reproducing here. Mm -hmm. And our answer to all that, how do we respond to these? And in this book, what we have used is the, the injunction of Allah's kalam, it says, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, Sa'udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati. We have used that hikmah of delivering the message of Islam. All this Christian propaganda, how to answer that, and how to use his book against him. His burhan against him. Then we took the liberty of sending these to every senator of the United States, including the president, Bill Clinton. And this is the response we have received. These are the responses that we have received from America to this book of ours. It says here, House of Representatives, Washington, D.C. Thank you for sending along the choice. I admit to not knowing much about the Islamic religion and therefore look forward to learning more through your book. Thank you again for thinking of me. Cordially yours. Next one. The Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense. Lengthy letter. Thanks. Congress of the United States, House of Representatives. Beautiful acknowledgement. Letters, letters, letters. Thanks, thanks. They seem to know the principle of Lain Shakartum Lazidan Nakum. They don't know the Quran, but they know the psychology. That if you are grateful, Allah will give you more. Thanks, thanks, thanks. They have done it. This is the one from Bill Clinton's wife. She sends us a card. Beautiful card, very short. Very brief. She says, your thoughtful gift means so much to me. Thank you for remembering me in this special way. Hillary, Rodhan, Clinton. Now, this is the way we are saying, we have to propagate this book. We have produced so far 200,000, and now we are doing the next 300,000, third 100,000 we are doing. We want to see that every Muslim has this book to arm himself with this knowledge and present it to his friends, to his Christian employees or his employers. You have a Filipino girl working for you. I said, give it to her. You have a Sri Lankan girl working for you in your house. Give it to her. You have whatever Hindi girl working for you. I said, give it to her. Whether she can read or whether she can't read, present it to them. And this book here is available here in Abu Dhabi for five dirhams each. A hardcover, gold embossed, 230 pages for five dirhams. And you only know the value of this when you say, this card was bought this morning from Abu Dhabi, Christmas card. This card cost five dirhams and 50 fields. 50 fields more for this. Five dirhams and 50 fields, this is only five dirhams. 230 pages, hardcover, gold embossed. I said, now, give this to your fellow countrymen. Happy Christmas, Happy New Year. Any excuse, Eid comes along, give it as an Eid gift. I says, man, this is how you can get involved in doing dawah in your own little way. So this is my humble suggestion to the community. And I said, the, one of the main reasons, what we are lacking, I was asked what we are lacking. You see, the Christian, the Christian, See, he has got a program. We in our Darul Ulums, in India, Pakistan, Ummul Qura, uh, Medina University, Al Ain, all over the Muslim world, every Muslim university, I take it even Al Azhar, how many languages do they teach? Arabic and a foreign language? Maybe, maybe, you know, in some universities, English. Maybe in some universities, French. One or two. Reason. Reason. Because your aim is to produce sheikhs and imams to lead people in the salat. You say, oh, the whole Muslim world needs people, you know, we say imams, 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 to do the khatib, to do the khutbah. So you're training the guy to become an imam and to deliver khutbah. You're not training da'is. Therefore, you don't need another language. Now, in America, there is another small group of Christians. They call themselves Mormons. They have the church established in Dubai. You see it in your, that uh, magazine given in the hotels. Every room has it, you know, about the things of interest in, Abu, in the UAE. And you'll find that the churches, churches. You see that the Mormon church is there in Dubai. Mormons. These Mormons, they start from Salt Lake City in America. In their university, they're teaching 
58 languages. I don't know whether you people are listening. 38 languages. What, the, what, what does an American do with 38 languages? Huh? In all the universities of the world, they'll teach one or two, one or two, one or two. Their university, they teach 38. Why 38? Training the people. They have a mission. In their system, every Mormon, he dedicates two years of his life for dawah. Free. Absolutely free of charge. Two years of his life, we are supposed to give two and a half percent of us our for wealth, not two and a half percent of our time. But they are prepared to give two years of their life for missionary activity. And they are asked at the university level, they said, look, when you qualify, where are you going to go for doing dawah? So the guy said, I'll go to Africa. So which Africa? It's vast, continent. He said, I'll go to South Africa. He said, well, what language do you want to learn? What community? There are so many communities in South Africa. You know, there are 11 different languages today, official languages in South Africa. 11. English, African, Tuzulu, Koza, Chwana, Nchonga. 11 different. What language? He said, well, I think I'll speak to the Africana, the ruler. He said, right, you have to learn Afrikaans. The other guy said, I want to speak to the Zulus, so you have to learn Zulu. You want to go to Pakistan, so you have to learn Urdu. You have to go to Indonesia, you have to learn Indonesian. You want to go to Malaysia, you have to learn Malay. 38 different languages they are learning because they have a mission. We have no mission. So we're satisfied with Arabic. Because to do Salat and lead people in Salat and do the khutbah on Friday, you don't need another language. Uh, so I'm they are out to do a job of work for which they are training their people. We are not out to do any job of work. No dawah work. That's not a part of our curriculum. And that is what we lack. We need comparative religion. How to talk to the Yahudi, Bil Hikmah. How to talk to the Nasara, Bil Hikmah. How to talk to the Hindu, Bil Hikmah. How to talk to the atheist, Bil Hikmah. This is what we need, which we are lacking. And this is not seem to be occurring to our learned people all over the world. In all of our Darululums, this thing is not a problem. This means that the dua in the Islamic world, those who graduated from universities, even religious universities, are not qualified for dawah work among non-Muslims. Maybe also among Muslims in their countries, if the matter concerns only prayers or leading congregations or delivering Juma speeches or otherwise. What do you suggest in reference to this? What are the qualifications? What are the specifications which qualify the propagator in modern times? How do we bring up the da'iyah, the propagator, to do da'wah work in his Muslim society or to do da'wah work abroad among the Muslim minorities and among non-Muslims? You see, I have been conducting classes to train young people. I have been offering my services to the universities, the Muslim universities of the world. So I'm prepared to come along and spend three months with you, free of charge at my expense, and train your students to how to respond to the Christian approaches, more especially for those students who are going overseas for further studies. Because when our children go for further studies to Britain or France or America, the people there are waiting for our children. Because they said, this child here is already trained to speak our language. You don't have to learn his language. And we can work from a home base. And the people will be able to absorb them in the community if they are converted. So they are waiting for our children, and they are like sitting ducks, targets. So now I have been offering my services, and in Saudi Arabia, I have had classes running, training people, people who are going out overseas for further studies. I said, now, master these techniques. I give them what is called a two-hour intense course, just two hours. And this two hours is of your lifetime. I don't say I want the man for 40 days or for four months. Mm, just two hours, and I set him on the road. I arm him with the, the, with the word with the, the Christian, you know, his book of authority and how to use his book to propagate our ideas. Kul hatu burhanakum with hikmah.
So this is my offer to the Muslims of the world, India, Pakistan, the Muslim universities, hmm? Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, Kuwait, Bahrain, wherever the Muslims are, Turkey, if they want me, I'm prepared to go along and carry this course as long as Allah has gives me the strength to do the job. I'm prepared to do this job absolutely free of charge to any Muslim university in the world. I'm prepared to spend some time and teach them this technique which I have, uh, I have stumbled across because this is something that you, know, you don't find them in books. You don't find them in books. You read books and books, but you don't know how to do the job, how to implement what you're reading. I teach you how to implement it. So this is my offer to the Muslim world. I'm prepared to go to any country in the world to go along and carry out this mission of mine, to train people to how to respond to the Christian missionary activities. Back again to the question asked before. What are the qualifications and the specifications that the Muslim propagator or da'ya should have to be able to do da'wah work among non-Muslims? Is it only to follow your ways of propagation that you teach? Are there any other particular specifications to be considered? You see, this is a world of specialization. There are so many things required for you to become a speaker to you become a lecturer, to you become an engineer. Everything has got its requirements. But now mine is the minimum requirement that the person needs in that environment where the Christian missionary is going to ask him questions that, look, Christ died for my sins, who died for yours? The one who says that, you see, Islam is a very harsh religion. The God of Islam is very cruel. He's bloodthirsty. For certain crimes, you chop off a man's hands. For certain other crimes, you chop off his head. You know, but our God is a merciful God. He's a loving Father in heaven. Now, how do you respond? Now, this is my method, is to teach the person how to respond to these problems. Otherwise, the qualification that is required is, for do a da'i, our Nabi Karim sallallahu he said, بَلِّغُ anni walaw ayah, Deliver the message regarding me, even if it is one verse. That is all. If you know one fact, share it. And the secret of knowledge is in this saying that if you start sharing that one fact that you know, Allah will add on more facts to that one fact of yours to spread the message. So your knowledge increases. It's an automatic thing. But I am giving what is called the minimum requirement of how to get started in this field. And then I leave the soldier to his own, own contrivances. He must now improve if he wants. Otherwise, at least he can defend himself. That person who goes through this course of mine can never be converted. He can never become a murtad, except for woman's sake or for money's sake. The book can never convert him. The philosophy, the theology can never convert him. Once he passes through my test of two hours, he can never become a murtad. That is the, what I'm achieving. Now to another point concerning propagation and the propagators. It is the mass media available now in modern times. Don't you see, Sheikh Ahmed, that there is a necessity in the Arab world and Muslim world for mass media to be recruited to serve Islamic da'wah, to serve it in the best possible way, whether in or out, for non-Muslims and Muslims, especially that we have facilities such as audio and videotapes. We have also the radio and TV transmission. We also have satellite transmission stations. Don't you see or don't you agree, Sheikh Ahmed, that we have a duty to use all these facilities with their tools, ways, and techniques in da'wah activities to the whole world, especially to non-Muslims? And at least the mass media could be beamed to the Muslim minorities living in the West or Asia or Africa 
to keep the Islam of the generations born there in an atmosphere and environment which is non-Islamic. I think Abu Dhabi TV had given us a very good start. After my debate with Jimmy Swaggart, the Abu Dhabi TV was able to reproduce that and dub it into Arabic. And they had it broadcast, you know, in English and in Arabic. And later on, after some time, again in English, they had it broadcast the debate as well as in Arabic. Now, to me, that type of an exercise used to be followed by all the Muslim, at least the, all the Muslim countries. In the countries, they have Christian missionaries and Christian uh, people, expatriates, working there. Now, there's no better way to deliver the message of Islam than in the guise of entertainment. Because these debates of mine, they are more like entertainment. In the guise of entertainment, we are delivering the message, which I'm sure it was a stupendous success in the UAE. And at that time, I read some newspaper uh, articles about the, about the Abu Dhabi TV, that it beat all the Middle East TV stations, you know, it beat them all. It was a number one, was Abu Dhabi TV. They did that, and somehow it has come to a standstill. But now I feel that that should be emulated by Bahrain TV, and Kuwait TV, and, and Saudi TV. Uh, why not all the TV stations of the world? I mean, I mean that's a ready material. And, 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 and a pleasurable material that the Muslim will love to listen and the Christian, he can also, he says, man, he will enjoy because he's both-sided. He's not one-sided. If one-sided, the man comes along and says, look, Jesus is not God. He says, now you're attacking my religion. So Christ was not crucified. He said, the man is attacking my religion. But now he said, now here are two proponents. The one is for and one is against. And you listen to both sides and make up your own mind. So, and in the guise, you're getting entertainment and you're getting education. But now, to me, that's one of the fields, and there's no copyright on my tapes. And I'm prepared to help all the TV stations of the world with master tapes, free of charge. Free of charge. And I don't know what more I can do. My literature is free of charge. My literature has got no copyright. My videotapes have no copyright. I, am, I have no copyright on myself. Anything that I produce, it's all yours. Take it, use it. So that is what I can do, the limited way. But otherwise, the idea is great. We should buy time. And, but when you already have the equipment in all the Muslim different countries, like Pakistan, Bangladesh, and all the Muslim countries, Egypt, Morocco, Algeria, Libya, why should you not make use of what is already available? And it's entertainment and it's free. But maybe because it's free, people are you know, reluctant to use it because it's free. If I put a charge, then maybe they might want to buy that time. But now I can't. I can't sell. I'm not in the market for sale. I said, look, I'm here to serve Islam, and if people can use me, you use me for Islam. I'm your slave. Let us, Sheikh Ahmed, turn to other subjects. Actually, the subjects I am going uh, to cast on you now, I expect them to be in the minds of our viewers watching us. And if there was a hotline between us and the viewers, you would have received them in the form of questions demanding answers. The first subject that I imagine that many are eager to know your opinion on is the Muslims, the Muslims believe in the divine books, the Torah, Zabur, Injil, and of course the glorious Quran. The Muslims reject the Bible now prevalent and shown in different copies which uh, you have informed us about and opened our eyes upon. But the Muslims deny that. Where do we Muslims, therefore, find the Torah, Zabur, and Injil, the books that we believe in as Muslims? Where do we find them? You see, we Muslims, we claim that we believe in the four heavenly books, the Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, and the Furqan. The Furqan is the Quran. We believe in these four heavenly books. 
Now, we are asking the people who are claiming to have those revelations that the Jews and the Christians put together, they have got this book called the Holy Bible. This Holy Bible translated Kitab al-Muqaddas, that's what they say. In the Arabic Bible, they have the title Kitab al-Muqaddas. It doesn't say Torah, Zabur, Injil. It says Kitab al-Muqaddas. Then they have divided this Kitab al-Muqaddas into two parts. They call it the Old Testament, Kitab al-Qadim, and Kitab al-Jadid. The yeah. Old Testament and the New Testament. And I am telling the Muslims of the world that you stick by what they name it. They say this is the Old Testament, say it's the Old Testament. They say this is the New Testament, say it's the New Testament. They don't say this is Torah, they don't say it's Zabur, they don't say it's Injil. Why do you say Injil, Torah and Zabur? Why? You're making a fool of yourself. Now, what, 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 what about this book then? In that case, what about this book? So we as Muslims, what I have done, my study, that I do find in this book words, words which can be attributed to Allah, the words of God, you can find in the book. And I can give you examples. I can show you in the book also words which appear to be the words of a prophet of God. I can give you examples of that. Then in the book I will show you other words, evidence, which is like that of an eyewitness or a ear witness, or somebody speaking from hearsay. There are three different types of evidences in this book and which any ordinary person, you don't have to be a theologian, you don't have to be a DD or a didact to be able to recognize those three different types of evidences in the Bible. Word of God sounds different, word of the prophet sounds different, word of a historian sounds different. Now we in Islam, we also have something similar, that type of evidence. We have the word of Allah in the Holy Quran, only Allah's kalam. This is not the biography of Muhammad because it doesn't tell us about his father's name, his mother's name. It doesn't tell us where he was born, where he died. It doesn't tell us the name of his sahabas. It doesn't tell us the name of his mother or of his wife or his daughter. Amazing book because this is not the biography of Muhammad. This is Allah's kalam. Whatever Allah spoke, it's here. Then we have the minutest detail about the Prophet's life. We know how many gray hairs he had. We know when he was angry or when he was happy, which of his veins stood out. We know which of his tooth was broken in the Battle of Uhad. We know the minutest detail about his life. We know more about his private life than we can know about our own father and mother. We have all that knowledge, but it's not in the book. It's not in the Quran. It's in another type of book called Hadith, books of Hadith, tradition, that gives us all that. Word of God, separate. Word of the Prophet, separate. Then we have the word of our historians. Imam Ghazali, Ibn Taymiyyah, Imam Abu Hanifa, and on and on and on. Again, separate books. Quran separate, Hadith separate, and our great men's writing separate. Then we have a fourth type of evidence. The Arabian Nights, Alf Layla wa Layla. These were stories read, uh, repeated around the campfires before Islam, among the Arabs. You have a separate book called Alf Layla wa Layla. Now, all these four, you will not treat them on the same level. Quran, Allah's Kalam, separate. Words of the Prophet, separate. Word of the historian, separate. And Alf Layla wa Layla, separate. Now, in the case of the Jews and the Christians, they are not that fortunate. They have the word of God in the book. They have the word of the Prophet in the book, they have the word of the historian in the book, and they have Alf Layla wa Layla also in the book. Alf Layla wa Layla, the thousand and one nights also in the book. So now they have a problem. Therefore Allah says, For lazina yaktubuna al-kitaba bi'aydihim, so woe to them who write the book with their own hands, thumma yakuluna hazamin billah. Then say this is from Allah. Liyashtarubi thamanan kalila. That they may benefit, some small benefit. So woe to them for what their hands to write and woe to them for what they earn. So in other words, this is the position. So we have to deal with this. So now here is the word of the Prophet of God. Here we find that Hazrat Musa, he prophesied the coming of our Nabi Kareem. 
which the Quran says and the Bible confirms. Where it confirms, no problem. Allah says, Qul araitum in kana min indillah. Says, can they see whether this book, the Quran, is from Allah? Qul araitum in kana min indillah. Wa kafartum bihi, yet they disbelieve in it. Wa shahida shahid, wa shahid, wa shahida shahidun min bani Israel la mithlihi. When a witness from among the children of Israel bore witness of one like him. You suggest this to the Jews and the Christians, because the Jews and the Christians, the Jewish Bible is in here. The Christian Bible contains the Jewish Bible. So the Jew is also included. So the Jew and the Christian both can be spoken to. He said, look, in your book, the Holy Prophet Moses was told by God Almighty that he was going to raise up another prophet like Musa from among their brethren, not from among themselves, but from among their brothers. Who is that prophet? I said, no, there's no such thing in my book. I said, open your book, book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 18, and now read it to him in English, if you know English, and I learned it in Arabic. It says, okay, lahum nabiyam min wasate ikhwate mithlaka. I'm reading the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 18 and 19. Okay, mu lahum nabiyam min wasate ikhwate mithlaka. Wa ajalu kalami fi famihi. Naam. Fa yakallamahum bi kulli ma usihi bihi. Almighty says that he will raise them up a prophet from among the brethren, like unto you, like Musa, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it will come to pass, verse 19, that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he, that prophet, shall speak in my name, I will fix him up. I will require it of him. In the Catholic Bible, say, I will take revenge. Very strong, very strong. We say, who is that prophet? Who speaks in the name of God? Who else, after Moses, who, which prophet was this, who spoke the word of God, everything he spoke was from God, not in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, but in the name of Allah, God Almighty. It's only the Quran. Open the Quran. And a beautiful, a beautiful example. In this Quran, this translation by Abdullah Yusuf Ali, it has a fantastic arrangement, as if it was done to prove a point. He had no such ideas. Yusuf Ali, some 50 years ago, almost 60 years ago, he had no such ideas that he was going to help us in our argument to prove a point. He said, that prophet shall speak in my name. And if you don't listen to him, I will fix you up. I am going to take revenge. In this Quran of Yusuf Ali's translation, 114 surahs, like every Quran, but the last surahs are small, small surahs, and in his arrangement, every surah is a different page. It starts. Let's start with the last chapter, Surah Nas, 114 chapter. It starts. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Next page. Chapter 110, Surah Falak. Falak. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Next page. Surah Ikhlas. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Every page. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. In the name of Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In whose name is Muhammad speaking? He is speaking in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. You know that this prophecy, when you analyze, it's also part of my book, The Choice. It's also part of my book, The Choice. All these things, facts are being given. In other words, that you read, you strengthen your Iman, and you use this, how to talk to the Jew, and how to talk to the Nasara. Then again, in, in the Christian Bible, it says, in your Bible, in the New Testament, Jesus Christ also is supposed to have spoken about our Nabi. In the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16, verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I go, I will send him. In Arabic, it says, Lakinni aqulu lakum al haqqu, innahu khairul lakum, in antalika, li allahu illa mantalik, la yatikum al muazzi, walakin in zahabtu ursilhu ilaykum. Now, I learned this in different languages. I learned it in Zulu, I learned it in Afrikaans, I learned it in French. 
In other words, makes your task easier. If you take a little trouble, do a little bit of homework, it is so pleasant. I met a man here in, the, in, this, <laughs> in this hotel of mine that I'm putting up, on the sixth floor. And uh, I'm asking him, he says, where you come from, sir? You come from Britain? He says, no, I come from France. So I says, you know, I was trying to learn your language. I said, yes. I said, I want you to hear. I hope I'm not murdering it. You know, you must forgive me. He says, no, no. So I said, so pendant, je vous dis la vérité. Il est avantageux pour vous que je parte. Car si je ne pars pas, les conseillers ne viendront pas vers vous. Mais si je m'avais, je vous l'enverrai. He's stunned. The man is stunned. He says, no, man, this is fantastic. He said, I'd like to meet you again. I said, look, I'm here on the sixth floor. Anytime I'm available, room 618. Come and see me. You know, it's an open sesame. Opens up doorways for you. If you take a little trouble to the Arab Christian, quote him in Arabic. To the English-speaking person, quote him in English. And to the natives of any other language, get the Bible in that language. Get the verses from my book, The Choice. Memorize it in the language to share with people. So this is the method I'm suggesting to people that every ordinary person can avail themselves of this opportunity. Ayn and Ajid, where do we find the Torah, Zabur, and Injil, do we find them in the word of the Lord or the word of the Prophet? Where do we find them? In whose words? You spoke about the narrators, the historians, and other things like Thousand and One Night. Where do we find Torahs, Jil, and Zabur? You see, we must understand ourselves, these terms, what they mean. My understanding is that when we say we believe in the Torah, it means that we believe in the revelation, the wahi, that Allah gave to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam. Everything that was given to him was from Allah, and we accept that as Allah's kalam. When we say the Zabur, it means to me that the revelation, the wahi, that Allah gave to Hazrat Dawud alayhi salam. That was the Zabur. And the Wahi, the revelation given by Allah Baritala to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, is called Injil. Now, we are asking the Jews and the Christians, have they got anything that was written by Hazrat Musa alayhi salam? The Torah, what Hazrat Musa alayhi salam said and wrote. Because what they get, the so-called Torah, what they say the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, they call it the Torah, who the Jews, they call it the Torah. In that five books, more than 700 times the words occur. The Lord spoke unto Moses, and Moses spoke unto the Lord. The Lord spoke unto Moses, and Moses spoke unto the Lord. In other words, Musa is not talking, and Allah is not talking. If somebody else is telling you that this was told by so-and-so, and this was told by so-and-so. If Hazrat Musa -Salam, wrote that, he would say, the Lord spoke unto me, and I said unto the Lord. The Lord said unto me, and I said unto the Lord. There's no such evidence. Then again, in this book supposed to be of Moses, the book of Deuteronomy, the last chapter, it speaks about the death of Musa alayhi salam. It says, and there, Moses died. Musa alayhi salam, he died in the past tense. And there, Moses died in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peer. And no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. Who's writing that? Unto this day, the man who's writing is alive. His Musa is not writing that I died. And Moses was. I'm reading it in English, the Bible, as they give it to me. The, and Moses was 120 years old when he died. And his natural powers had not abated. Meaning, if he had another 16-year-old wife, he might have done justice to her. He was still strong and virile. Did Moses say that? And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Did Musa say that? So on the very face of it, we know this is not the works of Musa alayhi salam. Zabur is the same. The Injil, they have the books they call the New Testament, which in Arabic they say Injil, you know, the books, certain books. There are New Testament is Kitab al-Jadid. It has got 27 books. 
And in the Bible that I have, I had the Bible I have, yes, in the Bible that I have, this one here, every word supposed to have originated with Jesus in the 27 books are written in red, red ink. Red ink means Jesus, black ink means people, people's words. All the red ink. 90% of the 27 books is black. That means according to their own confession, according to what they say, only 10% of the 27 books are supposed to be the words of Jesus. Jesus in his lifetime, he never wrote a word. Not a word was written in his lifetime. He never instructed anybody else to write a word, and not a word was written. Then the books that they are, they call Injile Matthew, Injile Marcus, Injile Lucas, Injile Johanna in Arabic. These four Injils, four Gospels. I said, now we believe in Injile Isa. This is, in, you tell me, the Christian is telling me, this is Injile Matthew, this is Injile Marcus, this is Injile Lucas, this is Injile Johanna. So right, okay. As such, I take it for what it's worth. I believe in Injile Isa. Have you got it? He says, no. So that's what I believe. If you produce something that was given by Isa alayhi salam, left by Isa salam, alayhi salam, with his signature, attested by somebody or his disciples, attested that these are the words of my Isa, it would mean something to me. But you haven't got anything like that. And these Gospels that they have written, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they have now some 24,000 manuscripts, old manuscripts. And out of the 24,000, no two are identical. How can you say this word of God? No two out of the 24,000, they are all different. How can you say this is the work of Jesus? These are his teachings. So Allah tells us in the Quran, This is big business. Because when they produced the, the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, they took out some of these things because they didn't believe it's the word of God. The Holy Trinity, which is in this King James Version, which is in the Roman Catholic Version of the Bible, it's there. In the Revised Standard Version and all modern translations, the verse on the Trinity is thrown out as a fabrication to please us, because Allah tells us in the Quran to tell them, Wala taqulu thalasa. Don't say Trinity. In tahu khairan lakum. This is stop it. It'll be better for you. In namallahu ilahu wahid. For you, Allah is one Allah. He's not three in one. That's what Allah told us 1400 years ago. Now they have taken it out and thrown it out as a fabrication. <laughs> so he says, look man, you're coming closer. Jesus is the only begotten son. The word begotten from John 3.16 is taken out in the modern translation. To appease us, because the Muslim says, Wama, this is, uh, Allah tells you, he says, Anna yakunu li waladun wa lam takun lo sahiba. They say that Allah has begotten a son. Allah says, وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَنُ وَلَدَا And they say that Ar-Rahman, the merciful God, has begotten a son. In answer to that, Allah says, لَكَدْ جِئْتُمْ شَيْءٍ إِدَّا It's one of the most abominable assertions one can make. The worst swearing you can give Allah is this. تَكَادُ السَّمَوَاتُ يَتَفَتَّرْنَا مِنْهُ Eddie, the skies are ready to burst. وَتَنْشَقَّ الْأَرْضُ And the earth to split asunder. وَتَخِرُّ الْجِبَالُ حَدَّا And the mountains to fall down in utter ruin. And the Rahman Walada. That they should say that Ar Rahman, the merciful God, has begotten a son. So now, this John 3.16, which says Jesus, the only begotten son, that word begotten is thrown out. To appease us, to please us, the Muslims, the no. This is their discovering, they finding out truth. We have to show it to them. They say, look, you are coming too, but you're dragging your feet. Come, man. Take one long step, like Armstrong took, took on the on, on the moon. This is one step for man and a thousand years this thing for mankind. Same thing, says, come with speed and come and reason together. Allah is telling us to talk to them. Allah is telling us, Qul, say, Ya Ahlul Kitab, Ta'ala, come. That we come to common terms as between us and you. And in coming to common terms, Allah lays down rules and conditions. Very reasonable, most reasonable. 
So number one, so Allah na'buda illa Allah, that we worship none but Allah, wala nushrika bihi shay'an, and that we associate no partners with him, wala yattakhiza ba'duna ba'dan arbaban min dunillah, and that we do not take from among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fa'in tawallaw, but if they turn back, fa'kulu shadu bianna muslimun, tell them that we are Muslims, we have submitted our wills to the will of Allah. Allah is telling us how to do the job, talk to them, call them, ta'ala. Ta'ala, we are not doing it. It is about time that we woke up to our responsibilities. As the Christian is working so hard for his religion, he has every right to do what he is doing. He is sincere. To me, he is sincere. He wants to save us from hellfire. It is also our duty to save him from hellfire. And for that, Allah shows us how to do the job with hikmah in the Quran, if you will only learn. Sheikh Ahmad did that. Sheikh Ahmad did that. We would have liked to continue on with this conversation longer and longer, that the viewers enjoy you more and more, but we don't like to burden you, hoping to meet you on another opportunity, inshallah, in United Arab Emirates in near future. I am very happy also to be with you. And I'm very, very grateful to the people of the UAE and to His Highness Sheikh Zayed bin Al Nahyan because he made it possible for me now to come possible for me now to come and go in as a national of Abu Dhabi. As a national of Abu Dhabi. You see, previously it took me about three years you know, to make my turn to come here. But in the past three weeks, I have come to this country three times, gone out and come in, gone out and come in, because I have got a multiple visa, thanks to His Highness, Sheikh Zayed, and to his departments, and to the Abu Dhabi TV, because they did something for me which put me on the map of the Muslim world. They dubbed my tape into Arabic. Without that, I would not have been known in the Arab world. Today, every Egyptian child seems to know me. Every Muslim who meets me from the Arab countries, they stop me in the street. And for this, I have to thank the UAE government, UAE, T, UAE Abu Dhabi TV, and His Highness Sheikh Zayed, because he received me with such kindness and, 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 and hospitality. I can't express it. You know, the, the humility with which he received me. As I was trying to apologize for exploiting his time, he says, no man, he feels honored to receive me. He makes me sit on his right hand side. And one hour he kept me there trying to tap my brains, and I was also trying to tap his brains. And there's so much I learned from him that can help me in my work intellectually. Ideas he has given me which I'm going to implement. I started implementing already, alhamdulillah. And he's asked me to do certain special jobs, which I'm prepared to carry out. So I am a servant of the Muslims, wherever they want me. And Abu Dhabi, I think, will be my second home, because I have a multiple visa. Anytime I want to feel like coming in, I can come in. And anytime I can go out and come back again. So I'm very, very grateful to Allah Bari Ta'ala and for the Sheikh and to the people of the UAE for making my life easy for me. Welcome anytime in Emirates. We thank you for this interview and we thank you for this chance that you have made available to us and to our viewers to enjoy your ideas and thoughts. May Allah grant you longer life, and may the peace of Allah, His mercy and His blessings be upon you.